Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and we are continuing in the Torah Bible study on the book of Genesis that I've entitled The Gospel According to Moses. And we're on the 85th podcast, 85th lesson. But we're on the third lesson, which is related to the saga of Joseph. Now, one thing I want you to be aware of at the website www.lightamenorah.org and remember Lighta Menorah is all one word Menorah is spelled M-E-N O-R-A-H so it's lightamenorah.org if you go to the website and come to the home page look at the top of the home page and you're going to see the words YouTube channel click on that it will take you to our YouTube channel and again some place there in the middle of the page or at the top of the page you'll see a number of words and one of them will be playlists and you can pick click on playlists and you will find the lessons on joseph not only in the playlist called genesis which has all 85 of these lessons starting with the first lesson back in genesis 1 but also you're going to see another playlist Okay, and that is um, Joseph of the Many Colored Coat. And so what I'm doing is putting in a separate playlist just on the saga of Joseph. Well, perhaps for those of you that just want to study chapter 37 through chapter 50, specifically on this Bible character. And so, again, I'm trying to take those topics that seemingly might be important to us and separating them in the separate playlists as a special topic. Now, in this lesson, the third lesson on the saga of Joseph, we want to continue again to develop the connections between Joseph, Yosef in Hebrew, and Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew. We want to continue to explore that Yosef, who saved the world with the bread of the earth, and who's considered a prototype of Messiah, a paradigm of Yeshua. We want to see those connections to Yeshua, who is the Savior of the world in himself as the bread from heaven. Many Jewish scholars, matter of fact, as early as the Talmudic period, so this is going to be 200 A.D. to about 500 A.D. roughly, they connected the Messiah to Joseph. And during that time in the Talmud, again, which was completed about 500 A.D., the rabbis had two distinct titles for Messiah. This was not true in Jesus' day whatsoever. This is in the Talmudic period. This is later on. But the rabbis would say, Messiah is Messiah, son of Joseph, Mashiach ben Yosef, and Messiah, son of David, Mashiach ben David. Now the reason being is they saw that the Bible implied that the Messiah had to die. And on the other hand, Messiah was to usher in the joyful, victorious age. The victory of Israel, where Israel, by God's hand, will be brought back to their land to live in peace forever. They're back, definitely since 1948, but that's not the final coming back. It cannot be. There's no peace in Israel as it's one war after another war. So we're not there yet, not to the Messianic age. So early on, the rabbis, they came up with these two names. And for them, it implied that the Messiah was two people. But for us, we say, all right, the dilemma in the Bible is solved. There's not two people. There's one. Jesus. Moshiach ben Yosef, he came to die. Moshiach ben David, he is the one again coming 
to rule. Now, once again, I've provided you some links for your further study. One of them happens to be to the ministry site called Netebia, which is the way of the Lord. Netebia, and to Elahan ben Avraham's book, Mashiach ben Yosef, where he does talk about the connections between Joseph and Jesus. Now, this is a messianic Jewish site. They believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And there's a lot of free resources here. I recommend that you actually look up at that website, not only Elahans ben Abraham's book, but also the teaching uh, from Zion, these magazines that are free, with literally hundreds of articles that are free to download. Uh, it is just amazing. So, amazing. so you have that link to Netevia. And then I have a link there to an article on Moshiach ben Yosef at the website that was created by John Parsons called Hebrew for Christians. And that article, again, is just superb. And I just I just know that you're you're going to love it. So again, I provided those links, and I hope that helps out. Now, also, in this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at some verses in here. Genesis 37, 28, where we find out that the brothers sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. And then Genesis 37, verse 36, where the Midianites sold Joseph to the Egyptians. And then our question becomes, uh huh, uh, this makes no sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. So, when we look at this, like in, for instance, Genesis 39, verse 1, the Ishmaelites sold him to, to Egypt. You say, wait a minute, the Ishmaelites sold him to Egypt? Well, back in 37, verse 36, it's the Midianites who sold them to Egypt. So I agree, it makes no sense to us who are living 3,800 years or maybe or nearly 4,000 years ago after these events. But what we're going to see, we're going to see that the Bible actually seemingly clears this up. Once again, we're going to see how awesome the Word of God actually is as we delve into this issue. And so we remember Jesus' words when he was talking to the Father. This is back in the book of John, I believe, in chapter 16 or 17. And he says, Father, sanctify my disciples in truth. Your word, Lord God, your written word is truth. And so we too want to be sanctified. We want to be made holy. We want to be set aside. We want to be separated in a special way. That's what it means to be holy. Because of his word. Come, Lord, and set us aside that way. By your word, by your truth. And the things that we learn in your instruction, in your Torah, especially about Jesus. Ready to go? Let's go. Now, I left off in session four and we started the idea of the paradigm okay the paradigm that god seems to set up that if you look at joseph you'll see jesus and if you see jesus you're going to see joseph and really the rabbis if you recall in the last lesson they saw it first matter of fact um it depends there's an argument as to when this started um Definitely by the Middle Ages, by the 13th century AD, okay, the Jewish scholars were saying Messiah is coming twice. And they named him Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. 
So Messiah, the son of Joseph, the suffering Messiah, who's going to die according to the scriptures, and Messiah, son of David, who's going to be the conquering one. They didn't use those terms in Jesus' day, but they understood that Messiah was coming more than once. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they got four names of Messiah, and those believers that were at uh, Qumran, okay, they thought, or not, maybe not all of them, but a number of them thought that Messiah was coming four times. Then the question was, if Messiah is coming four times, is it four separate guys? Or is it two separate guys? Or is it the same guy? Now, we know the answer. Okay, as Christians, we say, no, Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David is Jesus. Okay, but they started it. Um, and it's interesting when we take a look, uh, we can begin to see this connection because Joseph saved Israel. Who's Israel? Jacob. He saved his family. Okay, the family of Israel, because Jacob is renamed, and we've already done that uh, back in the in the the events of Jacob's life. He was renamed Israel. So J Joseph saves Israel. Yes, Jesus saves. Okay, is also the savior of Israel. Okay, but the savior of Israel in the whole world. Okay, so it's and on top of that, Joseph saves Israel with the bread of earth. They got food. Jesus saves the world with the bread from heaven himself. That, that's not, you say, that's an interesting coincidence. But again, there's so much more. And I talked last time about um, this book, Mashiach ben Yosef by Elahan ben Avraham. And I uh, wrote this book a while back, but uh, it is a really awesome book that goes into the entire correlation between Jesus and Joseph for us as Christians. And this is available at uh, nativia.org. And let me spell that for those people who are listening on the audio. N-E-T-I-V-Y-A-H dot org. Nativia.org and nativia. Nativia basically means the way of the Lord. And uh, as... Elachan says on the back, in the Jewish worldview, Joseph the patriarch was long been understood to be a prototype of the Messiah. Okay? And so a synonym of prototype is paradigm. The Talmud speaks about Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, the son of Joseph, and his death as a suffering servant who would bring partial redemption to Israel and pave the way for the coming of Mashiach ben David, the Messiah, the son of David. So again, he mentions again how uh, the Jewish scholars had already done this, and now we as Christians are beginning to catch up. Matter of fact, let's start with just one, okay? Uh, there's one that I want to emphasize that I didn't bring up last time. And so what I'm going to do, I'm in Genesis 37, and Genesis 37, I'm in verse 2, verse 1 and 2. So again, I'm reading from the Jerusalem Bible, okay? Not the Catholic version, this is the one that is from um, uh, Koran Publishers in Jerusalem. This is probably one of the best translations of the Torah uh, into English. And it is obviously uh, a standard Jewish Bible. Anyway, Genesis 37 verses 1 and 2. And Yaakov dwelt in the land in which his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. Uh, these are the generations of Yaakov. Yosef, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilchah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Yosef brought to his father their, their evil report. Now Israel loved Yosef more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat with long sleeves. All right. So Elahan ben Avraham. He takes that and he tries to help us undersee the correlation. So in here, what we have is, we just read that Joseph is a special son of Jacob. You're going to say, what happened to Benjamin? Benjamin is the younger son of Rachel. And he's not even brought up at all. Joseph is the one, his special son. You could theorize that perhaps... Jacob did 
had problems with his son Benjamin. Why? Because his beloved Rachel died when Benjamin was born. So every time he sees Benjamin, he is reminded of the death of his beloved Rachel. Remember how all this got started because of her. She was a beauty, okay? And so because of her physical beauty, all of a sudden uh, Jacob gets attached to her and all of a sudden the stuff continues. So it could very well be that he emphasizes Joseph because he's the firstborn of Rachel and Rachel was his first choice. So anyway, so with that in mind, Elahan ben Abraham says in his book, we, have, we will see already a special relationship between the father and his one son, even as he brings a bad report about his brothers back to his father. Yeshua, okay, of Nazareth, in several discussions with his brethren, the children of Israel, brought before them their sin. So in John chapter 9, verses 40 through 41, those of the Purushim, the Pharisees, who were with him, heard these things and said to him, We're not blind too, are we? Yeshua said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. He brings a bad report, okay? And he, t- and he doesn't hide it to his brothers. He tells them face to face, okay? The other thing is, um, so indeed, Jesus is bringing a bad report. But you remember in John 3.16, John 3, 16, I can quote it to you. Most of you guys have it. From the New American Standard, it says this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc., 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 right? Well, if you take only begotten and you put it back to the Greek, okay, the meaning should be, okay, the one and only son. Only begotten, but it should, it, it basically means the unique one, the one and only one. So here we have Jesus gives a bad report about his brothers, okay, his fellow countrymen, the Pharisees, and so on. And on top of that, he is the one and only one special son of the Father. So again, right there, right at the beginning, soon as you start 37, this correlation begins, and so it goes on. So where I left off last time, we uh, are going to pick up now in Genesis 37, Verses 19 through 20. Genesis 37, verses 19 through 20. We're going to continue with some of these correlations. So what's happening now is the brothers, okay, are all out shepherding the flock. And they're uh, up in a place called Dothan. So they're pretty far north, okay, because where Jacob is staying is a place called Hebron. And Hebron is south of Jerusalem, uh, let's call it, 40 miles, okay, roughly, 40, 50 miles. And that's on the mountains. So you get to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, Dothan, you keep going to the mountains all the way to almost 20 miles south of the Sea of Galilee, and you're about there, maybe 25 miles south in the the big Jezreel Valley, and that's where Dothan is. That's where they're at. So we pick the, the events up here, and they said this, and they said one to another. So here's the brothers talking. Behold, here comes the dreamer. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, an evil beast has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. Remember, they hated him because of his dreams. So they're conspiring together to kill him. Then we go to uh, ben, uh, Elachan ben Avraham and his book, Mashiach ben Yosef. And what happens is this. So they see Joseph from afar and they want to kill him. To this day, and I'm going to give you a little bit more background in here, okay? Uh, Because in this, first let me give you the verse. This is in Matthew 26, 3 through 4. And in that verse we read, Then the chief Cohen, the high priest, and the Zechonim of the people were gathered together in the court of the Cohen, the court of the priest, um, and who was called uh, Caiaphas, the high priest was Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Yeshua by stealth and kill him. They were plotting to kill him. So now we have Jesus' brothers, his fellow countrymen, his kinsmen plotting to kill him. Okay, and I mean, it. it's a Bible verse right, right there. But what I want to do is give some background. Yeshua today is seen from a distance by the children of Israel through a fog of prejudice and misunderstanding 
through the sins of an idolatrous religious system which misused the name Jesus, even attempting to erase his Jewishness. At the name, at that name, the Jew, for the most part, thinks negatively. So when they hear the name Jesus or Yeshua, they think negatively. Linking it to the sufferings of the centuries, they blame us for the Holocaust. You're a Christian, you sent us to the ovens. Why? They have a movie from World War II of Hitler in some speech saying he's a Christian. He's a believer in Jesus. So they've got this, okay? At that name, the Jew for the most part thinks negatively, link it to the sufferings of the centuries, wishing to kill even the memory of it. And so they call him Yeshu. Yeshu, you may not know, and you, you go to Israel, you'll hear this. So they call him Yeshu, but Yeshu is an acronym, like CIA, okay, or Washington, D.C. Okay, D.C. is an acronym, okay? So the thing is, is that it stands for this. Here's the Hebrew words. Yimach Shemo Veziko. That's what it is. Okay, it's not a name, it's an acronym. And it stands for this, may his name and memory be erased. So if you go to Israel, and all of a sudden you meet a Jew and you start talking, you say, oh yeah, his name's Yeshua. We know that. They just put him down, and little do you know it. Okay. So with regards to this, again, we see the correlation again that as his brothers tried to kill Joseph, the same thing, we see the same parallel uh, in the same parallel in Jesus' life. Let's take a look at another connection. I'm going to take a look at Genesis 37, verses 21 through 28 now. We'll continue in verse 21. And Reuven heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuven said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand on him, that he might, sa uh, that he might save him out of their hands, to deliver him back to his father. And it came to pass, when Yosef was come to his brethren, that they stripped Yosef of his coat, the long sleeve coat that was on him, and they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Yeshme Elim. Okay, Yesh, that's the Hebrew, or Ishmaelites to you. Okay. Came from Gilead with their camels, bearing gum, uh, gum bomb and ladunum, okay? I just, boy, ladunum, phew. I wish I was there. I'd like to get a you know, dozen ladunum, you know. Have that with a uh, nice Diet Coke on a Saturday. Oh, man, ladunum. I don't, I don't even know what ladunum is. I have to look that up sometime. Anyway, going to carry it down to Mitzrayim, which is Egypt, Mitzrayim. And Yehuda said to his brothers, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ish, Ish, Ish me Elim, the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh, and his brothers hearken to him. Then they there passed by Midianim, the Midianites, merchants, and they drew and lifted up jo Yosef out of the pit and sold Yosef to the Ishmaelim for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Yesh, uh, Yo uh, Yosef uh, into Mitzrayim or into Egypt. Now, they plotted to kill Joseph, but he didn't die. He arises from the ground, and he's sold to pagans. Now, Judah's name in Hebrew is Yehuda. Judas Iscariot, his name in Hebrew is Yehuda. Yehuda, in this event, seemed to influence, it doesn't say he, they, okay, sold, okay, their brother for silver. Happened to be 20 pieces. Yehuda, Judas Iscariot, sold Jesus for silver, 30 pieces. Same name. And the correlation keeps on going. That is, it's amazing. Now, I have to take an aside here there's two things we have to deal with before I continue on with this. When you read this in your English Bible, first of all, you have the Ishmaelites come along, and it sounds as if they're going to sell them to the Ishmaelites. 
But the Midianites almost seemingly take him out of the pit, or do they? And the Midianites, okay, sell them to the Ishmaelites, and they take him to... And all of a sudden, these two names are going... This is crazy. Ishmael, okay, and Midian. They're two separate names. Now, in the JPS Torah commentary, which I'm not going to go into, or in Dr. John Kareed's commentary... Nahum Sarma, Sarna, who is the scholar for the JPS Torah Commentary, a brilliant Bible historian and scholar, and Dr. Kareed, an Egyptologist, and a, a, again, one of our brilliant historians, when they look at this, one of the things that they say is, when we look at this story, we have to realize, number one, this story, okay, this one, based upon the dating and everything else, is probably over 3,500 years old. Maybe closer to 3,800 years old. And so when we look at this, uh, there's the possibility that in those days, okay, the Midianites were looked on as being part of the Ishmaelites. In other words, they were one and the same group. It makes sense because this is done again. Let's take a look. Judges chapter 8, verses 22 through 24. Now I'll have to explain this just a little bit. Both Sarna, Nahum Sarma, the JPS Torah commentary, and Dr. Kareed from his Genesis commentary bring this verse up. So I'm in Judges 8, 22, uh, Judges 8, verses 22 to 24. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Stop. When you read the story of Gideon, he defeats the Midianites. So you can go through that whole thing. They defeated the Midianites, right? So they're defeated. Question? Okay. If you defeat somebody, what they own and what they possess is your spoil. Correct? Good. Let's continue on. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said to them, I would make a request of you, that you would give me, every man, the earrings of his spoil. In other words, you defeated the Midianites. You're part of my army. You've got the spoil? Give me the earrings. Now, what the writer of Judges does, and we don't know who it is. We don't know who the writer of Judges is. This is not Moses. Moses is dead. Okay? All of a sudden, puts in an editorial comment. 3,800 years ago. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelim, Ishmaelites. In other words, what's the writer of Judges saying? The Midianites and the Ishmaelites are one and the same. My guess is I believe the Midianites were part of a bigger group called the Ishmaelites. I think the Ishmaelites had several different components, Midian being one of them. That's a guess on my part. And this helped me tremendously because as I think Kareed says, he said, this is a document that's 3,800 years old and we Christians complain that there's a mix-up in the names when for them 3,800 years ago, this made sense. We don't belong to that culture. We don't know what's going on, okay? But now we have two verses that seem to indicate, especially here, the writer of Judges, that these two are the same. So we got two different views on that. So that's number one. So I wanted to help you with that. Number two, who sold Joseph? This is a fascinating question. Who's, now let me read it to you. Here's Yehuda, this is verse 26. And you, Yehuda said to his brothers, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelim, the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he's our brother and our flesh. And his brothers hearkened to him. They agreed. Then there passed by Midianites. This is cool. 
Now that we have an understanding, they're probably the same, okay? It almost sounds like there's another group comes along, okay? This can get really confusing. And they're merchants. They drew and lifted Joseph out of the pit. That's exactly what it says in the Hebrew. The Midianites, they're the ones that drew him out of the pit. And they sold him to the Ishmaelites. What? But see, we have a problem here. That's why I had to want to go through this. This is very complex. If the Midianites and the Ishmaelites are separate, distinct, and they add to our confusion, if they were separate and distinct, this, this begins to make sense, that the Midianites, they drew him out and they sold him to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites took him to Egypt. However, as Dr. Creed and Dr. Sarna say, no, they're one and the same. Now hang on to this. I want to settle this whole issue. She'd say, all right, Dr. Creed, Dr. Sarna, great. We're going to agree with you guys. You guys are the scholars. Yes, and you have a valid argument. Uh, it could very well be that these two groups are the same. However, um, we read in this sentence, then they're passed by the Midianim, or the Ish probably the Ishmaelites, okay, and they drew him and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. And they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelim. Now this gets a little confusing because why would they sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites if they are the Ishmaelites because the Midianites and the Ishmaelites are the same? Now, there is one scholar who I dearly follow who says in his commentaries and on his audio and so on, um, and so I will say it, that Dennis Prager believes uh, that in his that they that, that the Midianites actually sold Joseph, the brothers didn't. So that's very interesting. I respect him. I totally disagree. So I wanted to let you know that I don't just because I love Dennis Prager so much, uh, I disagree with his view. I agree with Dr. John Kareed because Dr. Kareed he brought up another verse. And what happens is this. If we go to Genesis 45, 4, and Yosef said to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Yosef, your brother, whom you sold, whom you sold into Egypt. So now we have a verse telling us who the they are. You get it? So they, meaning the brothers, they're the ones that sold them to the Ishmaelites, Midianites, okay, who took him to Egypt. Because the Bible must agree. So you guys, another riddle seemingly solved. The Midianites and the Ishmaelites are, are seemingly intimately related. And you could take again a look at this in Judges chapter 8, starting in verse 24 through 28 where the Ishmaelites are the ones who wear gold rings. And so the people who had the gold rings take their rings off and they give them to Gideon because they were Midianite kings. So here we have in Judges that definitely the Ishmaelites and the Midianites seemingly were intimately connected. How? We have no idea. Um... But the point is, the people then got it. Not us. The Bible wasn't written to us. It was, but we need to understand it in its historical context. What did the people who first heard these words understood so that we can make sense of it and it has meaning for us today? Now, in Lesson 86, we're going to come to Genesis 38. And God inspires Moses to insert a story that seems so totally disconnected to Joseph. I mean, we don't even know why it's there, but it's there. It's the story of Judah and Tamar. It just comes out of nowhere. And so we ask, Lord, why did you do this to us? Why are you taking us on this bunny trail? It's seemingly... It's kind of 
In the meantime, while Joseph was being sold, Judah leaves his brothers. Maybe Judah was angry with his brothers because they nearly tried to kill him, and Judah saved him. So he takes off. He's had it with his family. We don't know. But it's a bunny trail. While Judah is going to be taken down to Egypt, this is what's going on with Judah. Why? You'd say, Lord, let's do this later. We, we want to get back to the story of Joseph. Why did Yahweh do this? And again, the Torah is silent. Or is it? Now, the story of Judah and Tamar is located in between two verses. The verses are like bookends. So before we get to 38, the last verse in 37 is verse 36, and it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. At the end of chapter 38, which is the end of the Judah Tamar story, we come to the verse verse of 39. Now remember, these verse numbers and titles and all that type of stuff, they came in well after the Middle Ages. There were no verse numbers. So we have two verses. If we eliminate all the numbers the number of the verses and the chapters and so on, we have two verses that seemingly are taking the Judah and Tamar story and putting it into a special place. Because verse 1 of 39, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian office, uh, officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bodyguard, bodyguard bought him from the Midianite, uh, Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So we have these specific two verses. It's almost as if God is purposely putting this story here. And he's saying, hey, it's, it's in these bookends. This is something important. And he wants us to see something. But what is it? Now, when we take a look at Jewish scholars and Christian scholars, there are many, many views on this and many theories. We'll deal with some of those. And some of them really make a lot of sense. And we can see, since the Torah is silent and, and God is not coming out specifically as to what's going on, we can see that we can, these speculations, these ideas, make sense. But for us, we're going to return to Jesus' words, John 5.39. Probably said between 24 to 30 AD, and Jesus said, Scripture testifies of me. And all they had at that time was the Tanakh. In other words, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. Now we've already seen the beginning of the connections between Yosef, Joseph, and Yeshua, Jesus. And we ask ourselves the question, is the Judah Tamar story somehow connected to this paradigm? One thing to keep in mind, God is engineering Joseph's life, Joseph's life through good times and bad times. He's setting up Joseph to be the savior of the world by the bread from the earth. Is this somehow related then that the Judah Tamar story is connected to Yeshua? the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that saves the world through himself as the bread of heaven? We'll have to wait and see. I'll see you then in Lesson 86. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50 that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father. Just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session with that blessing. That blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses to Aaron to bless the people. 
Yevarekenu Adonai Vishmarkenu Yair Adonai Panava Alenu Bekunakenu Yisa Adonai Panava Alenu Vyasem Lanu Shalom Vishem Yeshua Adonenu Amen So together Let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.